thank you for joining with us again this Wednesday evening for our Bible study in the book of Hebrews. We have for the last two Wednesday evenings studied Hebrews 11 in two different parts. The first time we studied verses 1 through 5, and then last time we studied verses 6 through 22. In Hebrews 11, we are finding what true faith really is by example. Examples of men and women, heroes, heroines, men and women of great faith, not just faith to believe in God, the existence of God, but they believed God. And their believing God is proved by how they lived. They were faithful, faithful to God, faithful his, to his commandments, faithful to everything that God had instructed them to do. And so what we're seeing is a, a series of stories, some 40 individuals either named or referenced in this chapter that prove that faith is how you live. And it is proving that no matter what the obstacles are that life will throw your way, you can be faithful to God. These individuals prove just that. As we look at these individuals, we're, we're, we're looking at uh, those who contributed so much to God's work and, and, and the plan that God had for bringing Jesus into the world because in some way they were all involved in that plan. And that's really what the book of Hebrews is all about, is showing how Christ is our Savior. He's our high priest. He's superior to all. And these individuals all in their own way played a role in bringing Christ into the world and the salvation that he brought to us when he went to the cross. Now today, uh, we're going to finish up the book of Hebrews chapter 11 by looking at verses 23 through 40. And so if you would just read with me those verses, and then we will come back and look at what they say. Beginning in verse 23 of Hebrews 11. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents, because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ's greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked for the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens." Women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. All these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. That's a reading of Hebrews 11, verses 23 through 40. Let us pray. 
Father, we thank you for uh, this great book of Hebrews that is a such great encouragement to us in a world that is so hostile to our faith and our commitment to you. We have these examples that are given here in chapter 11 of these great men and women who not only had faith, but they believed you, they trusted in you, they were faithful to you. Help us to be the same. Help us in our study today that we may learn greater truths of how faithfulness to you brings greater rewards than anything this earth can bring. We pray it all in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. This section of scripture begins with Moses. Moses' a story is one of the greatest in the Bible. It all begins in Exodus chapter 1 where his mother gave him up at birth to Pharaoh's daughter in order to save him from being killed with all the other male Hebrew babies. He grew up in Pharaoh's house, but was nursed and taught by his own mother. She obviously taught him about the Hebrew people and, and how they were used as slaves by the Egyptians. One day he saw an Egyptian taskmaster beating a Hebrew slave and killed him. Moses then had to flee Egypt for fear of retaliation. He was 40 years old when he left Egypt and all the treasures and pleasures of Pharaoh's house. Note again verses 25 and 26, which says, Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward." Because his mother had taught him about God and the Hebrew people, Moses chose to be with God's people and had the hope of a reward greater than anything that Egypt could possibly offer. The next 40 years of Moses' life was spent in Midian, tending sheep for Jethro, who would become his father-in-law. It was at the end of that 40 years that God called Moses from the burning bush to go into Egypt and to deliver the Hebrew people from bondage of slavery under Pharaoh. After making excuse after excuse as to why he wasn't the man for the job, he finally went with his brother Aaron to tell Pharaoh that God said, let my people go. Pharaoh finally let them go after his son died as a result of Pharaoh's stubbornness. The last 40 years of Moses' life was spent leading Israel out of Egypt and across the Red Sea on dry land. The Egyptian army pursued them into the river where they were drowned when God brought the waters back on them. Many things took place during those 40 years. Rebellion, provision from God, murmuring, death of thousands, food from heaven, water from rocks, but perhaps the most monumental event that was established was the Passover as a memorial to the deliverance on the night they left Egypt. If you'll notice again, verse 28, which says that by faith he, talking about Moses again, kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood. The Passover was to Israel as the Lord's Supper is to the Christian. A remembrance was made to the deliverance God gave to to Israel from Egypt, which was a type of captivity in sin. The Lord's Supper provides a time of remembrance God gave to us from captivity in sin through the body of Christ. In verses 30 and 31, we begin a series of stories, uh, just very brief, but I'll give you a little more information about them as we go. The story of Jericho is one of the great stories of the Bible. After crossing the Jordan River, Israel, under the leadership of Joshua, Israel, under the leadership of Joshua, began to conquer the land of Canaan. The first major city that they faced was Jericho. Spies had been sent in to spy out the city when they went into the house of of a harlot named Rahab. She helped them escape capture and let them out down the wall. A promise was made to spare her and her family because she had helped them. When Israel marched around Jericho, God had given the most unusual plan for victory. March around the city one time a day for six days and seven times on the seventh day. Have the priests blow the seven trumpets and then give a great shout and the walls will come down. Now I'm sure some of them probably thought, well, yeah, you're right, that's going to happen. 
but it did. They did exactly as God had commanded, and Jericho was taken without a fight. And Rahab and her family were spared because she had helped them. Incidentally, Rahab is listed as one of the ancestors of Jesus in Matthew 1 verse 5. She was married to Salmon, and they had a son named Boaz who married Ruth. Boaz and Ruth had a son named Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David, who became the great king of Israel. Verse 32, Gideon. Gideon was a judge in Israel and a great military leader who led Israel to defeat a Midianite army that was as numerous as locusts and the camels without number with only 300 men. Now, he started out with 32,000 and God said, no, that's too many. You need to cull that down. So 10,000 of them left and went home. But God said, that's still too many. And so he devised a scheme by which they would go down and lap out of the river and only 300 passed the test. So Gideon, with his 300 men, was able to defeat the army of the Midianites without a fight. The way they did it, God said, you give them a torch and a pitcher and a trumpet. And they're to put the torch in the pitcher. And when the signal is given, break the pitcher, the torches will light. This happened at night. Blow the trumpet and the Midianite army would think that there are literally tens of thousands against them. And they fled. And Gideon and his army defeated, or at least put to flight, the Midianite army. Barak was a military leader under Deborah, who was the only female judge of Israel. Together, they defeated the Canaanite army of Sisera. Samson was a judge and, and the one who took the vow of the Nazarite. Those who took that vow could never cut their hair. They abstained from wine, grapes, and dead bodies. He was victorious over Israel's enemies, primarily the Philistines, due to his tremendous strength. The secret was in his hair. However, Delilah tricked him into telling her the secret and she cut his hair as he slept. He was made a prisoner and chained to the columns of the temple Dagon, the Philistine god. His hair had grown back, and he pulled the pillars of the temple down upon himself, dying in that catastrophe, but at the same time killing more of Israel's enemies in his death than he did in his life. Jephthah was the son of a prostitute by Gilead. He was rejected by the other sons of his mother and formed a band of raiders and went to the land of Tob. When Israel was under attack by the Ammonites, the elders of Gilead asked Jephthah to come and help them fight. He agreed only if he could become their head. Jephthah made a vow to the Lord that if he would deliver the Ammonites into his hand, that whoever comes out of the door of his house when he returned he would offer as a sacrifice, as a burnt offering to God. When he returned home, his only child, a daughter, came out of his house. He kept his vow and offered her as a burnt offering to the Lord. The stories of David are numerous. He was a shepherd boy. He wrote many of the Psalms, including the beloved Psalm 23. He was the second king of Israel. He was a warrior. He was haunted by Saul. Saul, Saul was, was uh, afraid of David. In fact, he was jealous of David because the people were taunting him by saying, Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his tens of thousands. Saul attempted David's life. Even David's own children were against him at times. David's greatest desire was to build a house of worship to the Lord. But God said no. Your son will build me a house in which to worship me. David is called a man after God's own heart, according to Acts 13 and verse 22. It was through David's seed that God would establish a kingdom, and that seed was Jesus Christ. Samuel was the last judge and the first of the prophets in Israel. His mother was Hannah, who was barren and prayed daily with tears for a son. She promised God that if he would give her a son, she would dedicate him back to the Lord. When he was a lad, Hannah took him to Eli the priest and dedicated him to the Lord. He had a divine revelation that God was calling him to be a prophet. This was when he was a child in Eli's house. He was the one who later on became 
the, the prophet who anointed the first king Saul and later David as the first two kings of Israel. And then there's the prophets. Oh, there were many. Sixteen of them have Old Testament books that bear their names. Others were men like Elijah and Elisha. They all brought messages to the people of God and even messages to the enemies of God, such as Jonah, who went to the people of Nineveh and convinced them to finally repent. In verses 33 and 34, through faith they subdued kingdoms, the kingdoms of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, and eventually Assyria, Babylon, and Rome. Daniel was unharmed in the den of lions while in prison in Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego were all cast into the furnace of fire by Nebuchadnezzar. David escaped the sword of Saul more than once. Most were made strong, were valiant in battle, and turned to flight the armies of aliens. In verse 35, we have some references to widows receiving their dead. Elijah raised the widow of Zarephath's sons, 1 Kings 17. Elisha raised a Shunammite Shunamite son back to life, 2 Kings 4. Peter raised Dorcas back to life, Acts 9 and verse 40. And even Jesus raised several back to life himself. Prophets were tortured and died for their faith because they knew that there was a better life ahead. Such happened to Samson, Hananiah, and Jeremiah, and many others that we don't even have record of. Verse 36, Paul is one who received mockings and scourgings, was imprisoned more than once. He recounted much of his persecutions. You can read about those in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 37 Zechariah was stoned, 2 Chronicles 24. Stephen was the first martyr being stoned to death, according to Acts chapter 7. Paul was stoned and left for dead at Lystra in Acts chapter 14. According to history, Isaiah was placed between two timbers and sawn in two. James was killed with the sword, according to Acts 12. Many wandered with hardly anything to wear, anything to eat, or a place to live, escaping the wrath of their enemies and even the filth of the world that they lived in. Affliction and torment came upon many nameless children of God who remained faithful through it all. And verse 38 says, The world was not worthy, not worthy of these spiritual giants. Wherever they went, they were wanderers, living in caves, dens, and in the mountains. Their names are in the Lamb's Book of Life, even if they are not named here. And in verses 39 and 40, complete chapter 11, you see all these named and referenced are a testimonial to the fact that they were men and women of faith, not just a faith that God exists, but were faithful to God. Neither did they receive the end of the promise God had made to them. It was still in the future, but they believed God. And they were looking forward to the promised blessings. Now we have something better promised to us, Jesus Christ. All those great men and women of faith will receive the richest of God's eternal blessings, but they will not receive anything that he has not also promised to us, eternal life. Hebrews 11 is a testimony to the faith of the fathers and the mothers of old. It is a testimony to believing that God will keep his promises even if we can't receive them in our lifetime. Remember verse 1 of Hebrews 11, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hope is more than a dream or a wish. It is the expectation of receiving what has been promised. That is the way these saints of old lived. They lived by faith with the hope of receiving the promises that God had made to them. R.C.H. Linsky put it this way, and I quote, It is the final and supreme fulfillment, the consummation at the last day, the ultimate of all we are hoping for, of all that is not seen. It is the final approving of testimony of Christ before the whole world. When Christ shall confess us who have confessed him before men, before the Father, before the angels, 
It includes the resurrection and glorification of our bodies when Christ shall appear in the second epiphany to those who are expecting him for salvation. Thrice, Jesus promised, I will raise him up at the last day. All that this promise contains, the, the things hoped for, the things not seen, to be apprehended until they arrive only by faith, pure and simple. It is a city that has foundations, the new heaven and the new earth, when the holy city, the new Jerusalem, comes down from God out of heaven, which is the event that is described at length in Revelation chapter 21, end of quote. As Paul wrote near the end of his own life, himself not receiving the things promised, said this, Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me at that day, and not to me only, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. Hebrews 11 was written to these first century Christians to remind them of their forefathers and foremothers who had faced much opposition, persecution, trial, and even death, and still remained faithful to God. The bottom line to them was, if they could do it, you can do it too. And that is a strong admonition for us in the church today. As we have said, don't give in and don't give up. Let us pray. Holy Father, we, we do thank you that we call you our God and that you call us your children. And we thank you, Father, that, that we have this great book of Hebrews as a reminder of what faithfulness is all about. And our faithfulness to you is through faithfulness to Christ. Why he came, became our Savior, became our high priest, the one who stands between us and you and the only hope that we have for everlasting life. Thank you for this great chapter 11 that reminds us that even in adversity, even in persecution, and even in trial, we can remain faithful to you. We pray that we will. With your help, we can. We pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen.